morning everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Vidhi Sharma and I'm part of the adjunct faculty at UNWD. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome you all to the 7th Revit Vlogs much less. Before we, get, uh, before we go ahead, let's look at our agenda for the hour. So first we'll have the welcome note, followed by the introduction to our panelists for today. Um, then we'll have the panel discussion where the teams put forward their views, experts share their insights, and then we'll have the panel discussion. After that, we'll have the audience question and answer session and the closing. Kindly do know that the entire session is being photographed and video recorded for educational and promotional purposes. Now to tell us a bit more about Reddit Vlogs, I would like to invite Dr. Zena Khan, the assistant professor here at the OWD and founding creative mind behind the much list to tell us more about the event. subject for your courses. Uh, the whole reason for us um, bringing about this session was to get students to engage with industries and to give you guys a secure platform to actually ask questions and debate. So we've got our student teams who are ready. Uh, we've had a host of competitions. That's how we selected the winners. Uh, we've been doing this for the past three years. This is the seventh session that we are actually um, hosting. What's even more exciting was that we managed to get twice um, the Australian grant for from Council of Australian Arab Relations. So the first time we got it in 2017, last year we got to bring five students from Wollongong who spent about a week with us engaging with our students and the industry here. Uh, this year we managed to get the grant again and next year we get to take our students to Wollongong and engage with their students and their industry. So everybody starting from this semester who's engaging with the Revit blogs, you guys are eligible to apply next, next semester when we actually open up the uh, competition. And five winners from that competition are the ones who will be selected to go for the trip in August. So congratulations already for being here, for taking part, and we do hope you guys enjoy the session that we've got today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zina. Um, the theme for today's much list is ethics and information security in businesses. Due to the heavy reliance on data and over harvesting it, recent years have seen plenty of data breach cases. Amazon was hit by a breach scandal last year where large victims, large volumes of consumer data was made available on their website. Amazon claimed that it was not due to hacking but an inadvertent technical error. Ongoing revelations surrounding Facebook and the Cambridge Analytica scandal have raised concerns about who owns our data and how is it being used and shared. Amazon's Alexa repeated, recorded, and passed on private conversations from one user to another. Earlier this year, Apple halted their practice of allowing their contractors to listen to Siri because of a backlash from the public. What does this mean? In most cases, it means millions of dollars lost from consumers, lawsuits, bad publicity, loss of trust from society. But do employers and businesses have an obligation to, to consider such negative consequences? What are the principles or codes of conduct that should be guiding their data needs? Do safety measures cost more or do they lead, lead to safe, sustainable businesses? So how do we go forward? What is the answer to this dilemma? Are these issues real ethical issues in IT and businesses? This invited panel sifts through the sands of ethical dilemmas faced by business owners and managers around the world, the consequences and the need to embed good privacy and security protocols with real implementation of those protocols for, for customers' data security. In an intense, fun, collaborative setting, faculty, students, and experts from the industry will engage to debate whether data privacy and security are unnecessary burdens on cost of businesses or necessary measures to ensure data production and safety for consumers. 
We are honored and excited to welcome our panelists today. Our panelists for today are Mr. Jalil, Mr. Jalil Rahman. Mr. Jalil is an IT leader with over 23 years of experience in diverse organizations and has expertise in IT service management, change management, project management, team management, solutions delivery, and IT infrastructure design. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Computing from University of Portsmouth and Master of IT Management from the University of Wollongong. Currently heading the IT division of Prime Healthcare Group, Mr. Jalil has also served in senior positions at BlackerSmithKline and Abu Dhabi National Insurance Company. He is a collaborative leader with a keen vision to understand business challenges and opportunities to cultivate effective communications and to influence business strategy and direction. He guides his teams to deliver reliable, scalable and security IT services and solutions that are aligned with both defined and emerging requirements. We also have here today Ms. Devena Bhutsani, a performance-driven operations and marketing specialist with a successful track record while working in diverse industries such as shopping malls, service delivery, corporate gifts, and now information technology. Devena Tulsani works as a community executive at High Dubai, a free multi-device business discovery platform, which provides convenience of information to its users and growth opportunities for every business in the city. As the team lead, she is responsible for filling in information on the app and website with primary market research, along with the quality audit before it's accessible by the result residents of the city. In order to select our student panelists today, we had an initiative on campus. The storytelling and poster competition at UOWD took place last week. We had 15 teams competing. Two winning teams were chosen based on judges' scores and popular voting. Finally, the panel is moderated by Dr. Zina Treza Khan, and the Twitter questions will be handled by me, Mrs. Vivi Sharma. Now, with a minute to organize the panel stage, we will move to the next segment of today's majlis, the panel discussion. May I please request everyone not to move around once the discussion with majlis begins. Please switch off your phones. Uh, do not move in or out of the auditorium as we will be filming the session. Thank you. by profiling the customer and their usage. 
and then ensuring we are targeting you for those particular products or companies and services. Um, sometimes we enjoy that experience, sometimes we don't enjoy that experience. What's interesting is that as customers, we actually do readily give the permission and we are readily sharing our information online. Yet, there are certain times when we will turn around and we will say, that was not good enough. They have to, they have to uh, make sure my data was more secure. Um, they have to give me more privacy. So what we are hoping today as a panel is to kind of discuss where is that line that we draw between uh, to giving too much access to companies um, and companies uh, you know, trying to get too much access of data from customers. So we will start off with our first batch of um, the student speakers. And we'd like to hear from you guys on your perspectives on um, what the customer side might be as students who are using social media and different sites. Uh, what do you think are the takes that customers usually have when it comes to data and privacy? Yeah, so, yeah, good morning, one and all. My name is Banan, and my teammate is here. My name is Fatima. So, we are actually here talking about the information and the the uh, details maintained by a business. Usually every customer has this thing in their mind. What if my details get hacked? What will happen with my details? Actually these informations and all, they are being told uh, in many ways. Like we, we have seen in many movies and many articles which are shown up that how our details are being sold. So every customer, they have one in, in a feed that what will happen with the information. For example, in UAE recently, even many police has given us a warning that do not give your personal information like your uh, this, uh, bank account details and all. What these people do with it, they just take an account number. They call us like, now recently one issue was happening up. They were like, they are calling from central bank and your account has been blocked. Give us your uh, 16 digit uh, credit card number, so we will unblock it. In that 1000 people, 1000 people they will be sending. In that 10, uh, like 10, uh, like I can say 100, 200 people they will be active. There was, this is a prank. Press one who, do, who don't know what to do with it, they'll fall in it. So this leads to cyber crime. There are many issues we can say. One person here has lost 200,000 uh, grams, uh, many things are there. Recently I heard one uh, issue with there, one, um, one American, one uh, foreign uh, person in UAE, one African, uh, uh, like one gang, they showed him like millions of dollars. They were like, uh, these dollars are there if you do all these stuff and they put much amount of money and all. Later on, he found it, etc. So many people fall in it. So from uh, now, I can say bank wise means our informations they are being bought by some other companies. How we get all these advertisements? It's all because of our information being bought. We just think our name, our mobile number, it doesn't matter at all. But according to companies, it matters a lot because these information they are being used, they are being sold multiple times, uh, multiple times, and it's a huge network which handles. So from our customer point of view, we feel like our information is not that secure. There is a lag between uh, the information uh, which is being handled by the business uh, entities. Um, as customers, when you guys are using apps or when you are downloading something and you are about to use it, they usually ask you, um, do you give us access to your data, your images, photos, your directory, you know, contacts. And um, at that point, um, you say yes, and then you start using the app. But what's happening in the background is you've actually given them permission to access your data. As customers, how do you feel about a situation like that? Right now, as you told me, it was correct because we say yes. Why we, why we say yes? Because we want that work to get done at that time. We want that work because we are in a hurry. Whenever we go, we get, they ask us, Allah, Allah, do we read all the information? We just go on. But later on the future things, then only we will think, oh that day I gave in this one. Now suppose we are going to an internet cafe, we are opening a bank account and we are doing, we just give other other, we don't see anything. But later on if some other guy comes and sits over there, he opens same uh, website, it's a MVD, and the same all the information saved me, he'll be logging in and he'll be doing all that sort, it happens. So what uh, consumers from our side, we just want their work to get done at that time. We don't think about what will happen in the future. Then only we'll sit and we'll be like, oh shit, this has happened at that point. That's what we'll do. <laughs> so do you think the That's company right. has a burden of responsibility yeah. when they are asking you to give permission? Yes ma'am, they have got a burden of responsibility. <laughs> because it's the company who, who's the one who manages all these uh, uh, this uh, requirements, everything. It, it formally, is all, this is the company's uh, side. 
So when they give this, it's a company who has to be ensure who has to keep even more protective systems in order to get the uh, information safe. Because customer, they will be in thousands of, they will be giving. Because company has to be the one who should protect it, who should be the one. Customer, they will be in thousands of. We have to keep away again a security. Like uh, in uh, bank accounts, now we will go and we'll, uh, book a ticket made from Emirates. It just it, uh, it doesn't just get uh, the managed booking setting. Like uh, it getting goes into the fairly secure. So we have one password for it. If we forgot that password, we don't remember. We have to go to like we have the registered mobile number. We'll get that. So it's another part of uh, security, I can say. Okay. So with that concept, we move to the other group, and we would like to hear from you. Um, if you think of it from the company's perspectives, um, what they're saying is, as consumers, we need to use those apps. Um, and at that moment, when you really need to use, like, like let's say you downloaded a QR code reader, and you needed that, obviously, for maybe for a class, or maybe when you're in the metro and you needed that, right? And at that moment, that's when they tell you to give the access. So from, customer, from the company's perspective, what do you think are your responsibilities? Uh, would be the company's responsibilities towards consumers? Uh, if you're talking uh, in terms of the terms and conditions, uh, I have uh, I have a few more problems that I can I should address before I go on to the suggestions. So terms and conditions are mostly uh, the companies rely heavily on terms and conditions. It could be uh, it it is for legal formalities for for one, and the other thing is that they can also use it for uh, changing the brand reputation. For example, Facebook after their scandal. They had to pay five million dollars for that scandal, so in which they misused the customer's information. So um, Facebook, shortly after the scandal, they changed their terms and conditions uh, to uh, assure customers of their safety of information. So in this way, they can also um, change their reputation or alter their brand reputation. So uh, the few problems I had to address were that, um, un uh, apart from being lengthy and people have short time in the day. Uh, it's also very uh, complex and hard to follow. So uh, there was a study that compared the content of the terms and conditions to uh, famous books which are known to be hard to read. So uh, the Google's terms and conditions was compared to uh, Beowulf's the book which is very hard to read. And Apple's terms and conditions was compared to Frankenstein the book. So, <laughs> It's not always that the customers are uh, lazy or like you know they just skim through it. Even if they skim through it, they won't be able to understand it because of the complexity. So companies should make an active. Uh, uh, they should try to uh, make the content more simpler, much simpler. And uh, for example, when you go and get loans, uh, they give a guide at the start. Like uh, they give a, a short brief summary of uh, what you can expect as rules or codes of conduct. So if companies do that and uh, maybe uh, uh, shorten the content and give it in a simpler or briefer way, uh, customers could maybe pay more, understand it better, and you know uh, make an active attempt to actually go through go through it. So. Um, my suggestion would be just companies should uh, make an attempt to shorten the terms and conditions and give it a briefer yeah. uh, So basically information could be said to be the most powerful asset right now uh, for any business or whoever it is. So uh, right now in UAE a study says that uh, over 1 million fishing uh, uh, attempts have been conducted during the first quarter of this year. So it's 20% more than the previous year. So what, what I'm trying to basically say is that the more these things go up, the companies tend to suffer uh, because of people like this and they don't uh, conduct the necessary uh, measures to prevent such hackers or uh, people trying to get into these things, which is why uh, Yahoo recently they had a huge scandal and they ended up paying uh, 170 million dollars uh, because they had given out their, uh, the necessary information that had been collected by them. And uh, one major issue of uh, information being misused is uh, when people 
tend to give their credit card details or their bank details and although you are not supposed to show most of your digits on the payment thing, they, they would view extra digits which would lead to possibilities of them uh, tracking their cyber crime and they will you know get the number, they will try to make uh, things like that. So the way these things are handled is there are laws that are being uh, developed and these laws are mainly based on an ethical code. So ex for example let's take a psychiatrist. So if I talk to a psychiatrist, a moral code would be that that person will not share what I talk to that person to them. So that uh, law is based, is, uh, was developed, that privilege was brought in to protect that information that was given. So uh, based on all these things, the uh, main point that we are trying to make is that people think ahead before they give their information and uh, because of that companies need to ensure that whatever information they give that has to be protected. There's some very good um, points that they made. But here's the thing though, if you think about, for instance, Siri, right, or Alexa, the whole scandal with these two devices was that they're recording. Of course they're recording, we know that. If you're using Siri or Alexa, you know it's a recording device. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's based on voice command, so it has to be able to understand your command, and it will understand it only if it's recording those commands. Right? But the issue became that people didn't know they were constantly recording everything, even when they were not activated. And that became the problem. So it wasn't even so much as customers not reading the terms and conditions, but the fact that this was not never in the terms and conditions that the company was actually providing. So with that, we're going to now come to, of course, our um, panel of industry experts. And I will start with Nivena first. Um, so if you could just tell us a little bit about what you do with Hi5, Hi5 and then we will throw back on our question. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, Dr. Zina. It's really fun to come back to university and see the students again. It's more fun. Uh, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Dineena Vatani. Uh, I am Kanya Vatani as well. So if you see that name somewhere, so don't worry. I've got my name changed after I got married. So I'm Dineena Vatani and Kanya Vatani. There's nobody missing in the panel, so don't worry. <laughs> Okay, so I work with Hyderabad and I'm the operations and marketing team of it. So what Hyderabad is, it is a discovery platform for any business in be it a hotel, be it a laundry, be it a supermarket, be it any kind of business, we have it listed on Hyderabad. So when I say I'm listing businesses, I mean I give generic information about those businesses. Very general. Contact details, email addresses, social media pages, website, what does the business do exactly, where is it located, stuff like that. Now, uh, the, we collect that information first hand. So we don't take it from any secondary platform or any other uh, source of uh, data. We collect it first hand. So we either have visited the business personally ourselves with our free teams, or we have called and confirmed all the information we have. So the business, the, uh, the app actually just helps you sort of find out businesses around you, wherever you are located, be it any business, be it any information that you might require for that business. So that's what exactly I do. We also have a deals page where we are, again consolidate information on promotions and uh, deals and offers happening around the city. Again, we collect it first hand. Everything that's there is genuine, that is first hand to be collected. So that's very interesting because you're saying everything that you collect is first hand. Whereas as customers, our experience usually is that companies are collecting our information most of the time second hand. Correct. Right? So this difference between collecting it first hand and second hand, what's the difference in terms of security and privacy? Security and privacy, uh, the responsibility increases on us because we know that the information that we have collected is true, is valid, is updated. And the issue with us mainly is that individually, information of each business doesn't matter that much because it's just general information that a business is comfortable in giving away. The challenge with us is the bulk of information that we have. So if you come down to me and you tell me that, okay, tell me all the, business, the legal uh, businesses in the back. I have a whole list of it with everybody's contact details, with even the managers and the mobile numbers for that instance, email addresses. So these are like really, really huge gateways for anybody who would want to reach data or use it you know, for their advantage. So that's where the responsibility and the accountability increases for our company. And Hyderabad is actually an initiative by the Hyderabad government. 
So you can understand the level of privacy and the level of uh, ethical nature that the government is going to have. So we have very, very high standards, standards of how we give away that data or how we use it. Right. We are open to speaking to companies who might need the data for ethical reasons, but uh, we make sure that anybody browsing our pages, if they browse more than five to six pages continuously on a particular category, we stop them. We ask them to sign up so that we at least know who the person is and we can contact them again or we can block them if they keep doing the same thing, they keep spamming our stuff. Or we, 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 we completely understand, of course, from an IP perspective, I'm sure Mr. Jerry will tell us more about that, that we can surely spot people who are there on our website for a longer period of time or who browse through more number of pages. So we control all that, we keep our eyes open because for us, it's more of a way to be when it comes to data privacy. The businesses are more concerned that our data and our mobile numbers and our contact details should not go out to places where we don't want them to reach. We want users, we want users to find us directly. So we are okay with users contacting us, but not just anybody. What's exciting to hear is because you guys do a big B2B business to business, um, we know customers very easily give out that permission, like you said. If I needed an app and I have to download it, it's asking me for permission and I'm instantly giving that permission. Is it that easy for businesses to give you that permission? No. Um, as, uh, as your students mentioned here, that uh, customers are mostly in a hurry. Sometimes when we want something, we want to download something, we are in a hurry. So we quickly just say allow, allow, we just say yes to everything. But businesses, if they are busy, even then, they will open their eyes and ears, they listen to everything we say, they ask us a million questions just to give us their contact number. You won't believe it. It's so easy for us to just give away our mobile numbers just to get the next same message or just to get the wi for those two minutes because your WhatsApp message is not getting through. But the moment the business is to give their landline number of their marketing manager or of their IT manager, they ask us at least 10 questions. Why do you want it? Could you send us an email? Could you just give us something in writing? We are so particular about the contact details of the giveaway. Nothing in comparison to how we give it. In a way, it's like Steve Jobs' example. He, when he developed the iPad, he said even a toddler can use it. I've made a device that even a toddler could use it. A toddler is usually in the age of about two years old. Yet his teenage children were never allowed to use that tablet. So that kind of tells you the people who are behind the driving of the data, they know the risks. That's why when it's a business that's being asked for that information, they're actually a lot more uh, careful about giving that information out. Yet when they're harvesting that information from the customers, the users, making the onus is on us at the end that we are giving out that information. So with that, I'm going to move to Mr. Nadine. He's the IP director for Prime Health Group. Uh, so, sir, could you tell us a little bit about what you do and then we will move on to the topic itself? Good morning. Um, Thank you, thank you for this opportunity to come back to the and after my master's here for It's been quite a few years it's nice to see the faces again. Um, yeah, <laughs> many of them are here. Um, now, I've, uh, I take care of IT for Prime. Uh, Prime has an hospital, uh, 15 clinics, uh, diagnostic centers, we've got corporate clinics, uh, uh, home care as well. So there are pharmacies. So there's, there's quite a few traditions and when you talk about data, there's a lot of data that comes in, uh, especially in healthcare. Healthcare is one organization that sits with, sits on a lot of customer data and like we can go to the retail you buy as well, but we can go out of the place. They do loyalty programs, they do a lot of things to actually capture your data because they don't know who's buying from them. Especially if you know, it's a very sophisticated thing, what they call the brick and mortar shop, unlike an online shopping. Online shopping, you still have to have some information. Um, healthcare, we, we have everything about, about our customers and we really don't call them customers as patients. Right? So we have their names, their, you know, if it's a US social security number, your it's ID, age, gender, you, you name it, we have everything. Right? Now that makes it even more challenging for us to make sure that it's secure. It only falls in the hands of IT. Now the example earlier, the student gave the hospital in earlier days, it was you and just the doctor, you know, and, and only the doctor knew and you were more concerned about whether the doctor would disclose that information. Now everything is digital. The doctor documents it. It goes as a claim to the insurance, so the insurance knows about it. We call the contact center, they're connected. They know that you visited a psychiatrist before. So the contact center person knows that you're going to visit a psychiatrist. We 
you disclose it? So, you know, how much of information do we show the contact center? Do we just show that we had an appointment? Do we show uh, a little more details? Now, if you want to balance between what we call the customer experience, you expect a better experience. You, know, you expect a you know, more user friendly and better experience, a contact center person to identify you immediately, know that you've been to this doctor, and maybe you don't know some more things and make that experience easy for you. But if you want to do that, you need to give this person more information. So, where you draw the line between the right level of information. Second is how do you ensure within an organization that that information is not misused. You know, the person doesn't you know, take it away and use it for something else. Or, you know, and that's one part of it. Now going back to what you told regarding speaking to notes, which is actually <laughs> you know, saying this thing. So conflict, you know, when you talk about terms and conditions, or even you know, Steve Jobs, the example now of the child using it. Um, this mainly happens because of there are conflicts of interest between what the organization wants and what the customer really wants, right? So, you know, you spoke about, you know, uh, taking care of in the terms and conditions, right? But terms and conditions, the objective of that for an organization is actually to uh, mitigate the risks that the organization has. That's, that it's got quite a number of legality and, and you know, chances that, just like you said, all the lawsuits that happen in the finality that have been paid in videos. Now, how do they protect themselves against that? That that doesn't happen. That's why there comes in the you know, conditions of the that's a interest. Not really to it's not really written in the interest of the customer. Right? So that's where the conflict really happens. Right? But whether you are expecting or we as a customer are expecting terms and conditions to be written in such a way that you know it's clear to me what I am actually, you know, confirming to the organization and I'm, I'm actually what is the risk that I'm putting into the organization. That's not what the organization so that's where I think uh, the differences come. The perception. The perception, perception yeah. So, yeah. So that's that's one thing. And second thing is organizations are putting plans to monetize the data. Right? There's a lot of data monetization that's happening now. So that's again a you know a conflict of you know interest between what you're giving the data for, but their interest is how do I now I have this data, how can I make more money from this data? Right? So it's, and, and sometimes I'll give you a straightforward example which you can relate to here if you use uh, one of the leading telecom providers here. They have this uh, smiling program you know, where you have royalty points. Now if you download that app and use it, I don't know how many of you noticed that in the, in the uh, app, the terms and conditions, it actually tracks your location. You can't turn off your uh, location tracking on that. Now why do they do that? That's the whole program that they are selling your wearables to the businesses, because when you are around, let's say, five more around a particular, you know, they they are actually helping those businesses to market to you. Right? They know your exact location where you are, and they know you're passing by this, and this you are a potential customer who could walk into that space. So they are using that. Now, I really if you look at it, if, if they had put in very clearly that this could be used for marketing, and you know, you're going to be monitored when you go around, I think you would say no, right? Or if we have an option to say selectively, these are things I can say yes to and these are work that I can say no to, you would, you would actually select which one you want to say yes and no. If that was done, see, keeping in mind the customer, but that's done keeping in mind the legality, right? So they just have one general huge legal document, which, like you rightly said, you can't make sense of it, because it's written as very legal terms and conditions. And it all it covers everything, including tracking yourself, you know, redeeming your points, everything. And you would just say yes because you've already your points, right? So I think this is where things are looked at differently by the customer and the organization, and that's where the major challenge is coming. Going back to healthcare, it's, it's definitely a huge challenge. We have put in controls like I think one in the system, and, and this is sometimes even debated by doctors uh, internally within the organization. So if you're visiting a doctor now. You know, the doctor needs to see your previous visits, even if you have been to a different doctor, to just give you the right treatment so that the, uh, what we call the treatment outcomes are right, if you get the best treatment that's possible. Um, now, what we have talked about, what the controls that we have put in our system is like, if, but, you know, only the doctor that you have an appointment with can see your thoughts. Any doctor just can't, you know, browse around and look at the, you know, all the patients staying there and look at it. However, there's a debate, there's, there's an emergency call, a doctor who's on duty gets a call and wants to help that patient but can't see the cause, how do I manage, right? So there are, you know, you need to manage between these two, right? That's also a, a pressing need, but how do you manage that? 
Right now, we're basically working on you know, mainly the OPD, the outpatient uh, you know, facility. Then it's quite easy for me to say, okay, if you have an appointment with the doctor, or a patient has an appointment with the doctor, the patient gets to, or the doctor gets to see that record. And if, it, if a doctor has not seen that patient gone before, doesn't get to see that record. Right? So these are the little controls that we need to make sure you know, we put in to make sure that the data is not falling into the hands of I'm not saying hands for people who will misuse it, but you know, you're just unnecessarily opening up the data for everybody where there would be more chances of you know misuse. And then comes all the you know agreements or all the non-disclosures that you need to make the doctors and like I said the contact and the other sign. So that again, uh, it, again it falls actually the protecting the organization because tomorrow if the data breach happens, the organization is only trying to protect that it's that the risk is not from or the protect itself from the legality saying that the employee is responsible and the employee is pay it, pay it. So the interest of why they're doing it is slightly different. Right. 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 That's where the biggest gap is and that's where the biggest gap is. Challenges. But I also think it's interesting because if you think about the health sector as an industry, uh, we don't actually hear a lot about data breaches from the uh, the medical side of it. We get to hear from like this the insurance side of it. Uh, what is that though? There has been, uh, maybe it's not been in, in light light that much in this part of the world. I again, um, see, the, the devil pay like all of this is finally money, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, is it like a devil pay? If you look at what happened in US last year, there was a huge hack uh, that happened. You know, there was more than one, but there's one hospital who went to a manual operation for almost a month because there was, you know, um, an encryption kind of an attack that happened there. The entire patient's data was down and they had to go to manual. And the whole idea was again, they were, it was an accident that they were you know, demanding and giving a lot of money. Um, now, there are laws there which actually is very stringent and people are careful about right? That's why they have that happened. Uh, if you ask me, the laws here are just getting mature. Right? Mm -hmm. So even if an hacker gets to the data, they, they, they can't make much money out of it. Right. Right? Because the laws are not in place yet, some of them. Right. Uh, off late, some of them have come. So that's the reason hackers or others are not uh, you know, actually approaching them. Right? Right. But there are other areas, you know, maybe like, you know, there are other areas like clinical studies. Now, yeah. Going back to the ownership of data, I think that's one of the points in the Data, especially when it comes to patient data. Now it's, it's, it's a patient, it's your data sitting with an healthcare organization. That's the healthcare organization for it, there's a patient of And how much of, of, of the healthcare organization, me being a healthcare organization, use that data for clinical trials without patient permission. Right? Um, so these are, you know, again, that's not discussed much here because there's not a lot of uh, clinical trials happening in this region, but it is definitely happening as well. So this is one of the one topics. So just moving on from the medical sector, if I move to the education sector and talk about students, who owns your data, your grades, that's actually on our system. We are grading you, we are grading your assessments, and the marks are readily available. And unlike hospitals, um, universities actually, for instance, a faculty, one faculty could access student record of any student in the system, irrespective of whether they have ever taught you, or if um, they're, you know, you, they're currently teaching you in a subject. So as students, I would just like to throw it back at you guys, as a consumer in an education sector, how would that make you feel? Like what he said. So clinical trials in medical sector would be like if we did studies in the university or based on grades from students' uh, subjects and things like that. Um, would, you, would it matter to you if faculty were taking those grades? and actually using that for studies without really coming back to it and telling you, hey, guess what, I'm going to use your marks. Well, actually, information is information. <laughs> <laughs> it matters because uh, now our data, like uh, in college, you know, we, we have given a name of uh, contact details, you know. All these details are being used by all these, like, many institutions, like academia, or many new education institutions where uh, like now recently one new one has come up by two. They are doing a lot of promotion out there. So from there, what's their main thing is they are given their volunteer work that just go and get uh, from parents the details of the children. Write their name and uh, mobile number and just get it out. For what reason? They'll, some, they'll give one free session everything, but before that you have to sign up. 
ये फिर किधर क्रेडिट कर दीजिए। वांस एनीवेज एवरीवन वोंट बी रिमेम्बरिंग ओके आई हैव टू अंस सब्सक्राइब बाय दिस। देर टू नाफ्टर थर्टी डेज दे लॉट में डिटेक्ट वर्ड अमाउंट ऑफ मनी एंड दे डिटेक्ट ओ इफ यू वांट कैंसल यू हैव टू अगेन गो थ्रू दिस फॉर्म। सो एनीवेज दे आर दे आर इन गेनिंग प्रॉफिट। दे मेन थिंग दैट्स व्हाट वर्ड मनी। एवरीवन नीड्स मनी। सो इवन आर इन मार्क्स एंड ऑल इट विल बी � Money only, I like it. How much you get? Just to add on to what Sir said, see, wherever people are involved, they are always feel threat of the loss of uh, data and information. So, what companies can get to is they could implement a code of conduct when they are collecting these information. So, there is a uh, ten, 10 commandments of computer ethics that companies can implement. So this is like a solution to what issues that we spoke about. So once this is implemented, so for example, the healthcare, uh, what you were speaking about, uh, Anthem Healthcare, which is a US healthcare company, uh, they they had to pay millions of dollars because 80 million cost uh, patients data was released. And also Google, Google also is accused of uh, tracking people's whereabouts when their location data is on. So. Uh, this is basically just to give you an idea of what the solution would be to the problems that we spoke about. Um, I think when you're talking about solutions, the European Union came up with the whole law that was there where they are now expecting companies to actually implement it and pay a certain amount um, for the privilege of accessing consumer data. Uh, could you tell us a little bit? Yeah. Uh, GDPR of the European Union has come out, I think it's a very good initiative and, and, and yes. it actually talks about uh, uh, oversimplified evidence. Let's put it in the new oversimplified evidence. So it talks about taking your permission before using it or, or letting the users or the customers know exactly what the data is going to be used for and the, the organization cannot use it for anything more beyond that. And it's like we have here a law, I don't know how many of you are aware of that. Any Marketing SMSs that are sent out need to have an opt-out option. Right? That's by law. Right? Um, so it's, it, that's GPR is more a little bit of reverse for that. This is once you send the marketing, you know, mailers out or marketing messages out. But the other one is when you collect the data itself, you need to be especially uh, certain data. So they're, they're called personally identifiable data, so PRI, the kind of data. Any of these data so that would be like for for instance, you may hear it's like you can uniquely identify a person. Um, your passport number can be identified as your name with date of birth and age, you put all these together and So when you collect these kind of data, you need to inform the, the customer what is it used for. And and the organization also, I said oversimplifies because there are other, other things as well in the law which talks about how you're going to store it, how you're going to, you know, the retention of it, when you're going to delete it from your database, and yeah, so all that has to be defined and deep. That's what the GDPR. So it's a, it's a very good initiative by the government, and there are the UA government is working on something very similar as well. So a lot of governments are working on this, and I think that's that's definitely the point. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing. Right. So I think overall, what we realize is when you you we can continue talking about this because it's one of those things that hits everybody. It's one of those things that we've all faced. That dilemma: should I say yes, allow, or shouldn't I just say let's not use that app? So. I think the onus isn't just on the company, even governments need to bring in the rules and regulations and the top-down effect always works, no matter what the industry or what the issue. But again, the uh, responsibility also is with us. Um, yes, we can make a fuss about how companies are not telling up, but if we make the effort to read a little, find out a little about what the company is actually doing, I think that gives us a very good idea about um, what the company plans to do with the data that I'm providing. Right? So with that, I think we're going to open up the platform for questions and answers. I will send it off to me for that. I have some really interesting questions that have been asked by the students today. Uh, let me start off with Sarah's question. How do you think companies can market their products to consumers using the internet and at the same time secure consumer data? So maybe I'll push that to go to it. It's, it's a trade-off. So if you want convenience, then the companies are going to be using your data. 
in, for example, if uh, I'm looking for sweets a particular day, and I from my phone I browse through a website which is selling chocolates or cakes. If I go to Instagram, trust me, it's going to be completely filled up with uh, sponsored ads of cakes and chocolates. And even if I don't buy them, I'm sure I'm going to put on a lot of weight in the next week because I'm sure you're going to buy a big bunch of them. So uh, it all depends. Now see, if you want that convenience, then yes, go along and click all the yeses and let them have your data. Uh, like um, someone I know says, like, okay, if you're not the president of your country, it's okay, your data is not going to drop in your life so much. But it all depends on what you think whether you think your privacy is important, whether you want to be accessible anytime, any place, by any company around the world. Uh, if you're just walking down the Mall, and as Mr. Jelly also gave the Mall example, just walking around the Mall, and you want to do something quickly on Wi-Fi, you connect to Dubai Mall Wi-Fi. The Dubai Mall can actually track where you're walking in the mall, and they will send you SMSs or notifications based on the promotions or new collections in the lane that you're walking in. The brands around you, which are literally like, there are SMS for Babe and you can see the Babe shop in front of you. So now it all depends on you. Do you want that much? Do you want to be accessible all the time, 24-7? Do you want your information out there to make your life easy? Because that's the argument that businesses use. We are making the life of users easy. We are making information and products and services available to users when they might need it. So it all depends on our choices. But the data is surely extensively being used without our And Mr. Jenny, any um, things that companies do to protect that information that they are ultimately collecting from the government consumers? There are, in, there are cases, it, it depends from organizations. So I think it, it because we are talking about ethics as well, so it also depends on what is the ethics of the organization. Right. There are organizations who overdo certain things and their organizations who are quite strong on their ethics and say, you know, we really step into that space. And so, like I said, you know, what we're doing in our organization is to protect the data of the patient that only one, uh, the, the physician or the doctor who has an appointment with that patient, or the patient has an appointment with that physician, they get to see the data of this note. It's not necessarily every week always the same. So it depends on the principles of the particular organization. Uh, there could be uh, organizations that, that actually go a little ahead or you know, take those extra steps to actually protect the data. Right. Right. Um, because if you look at it from, from IT perspective, from, uh, those of you who are IT students who are in, in that line, you know, the CIA, the, the confidentiality, integrity, and you know, accountability of the data has been always there. That has been the, the backbone of IT. It needs to be confidential. Give it to only people who need it on need based access and not open up the way you have you know integrity, you don't want the data to be you know, corrupted and you know, uh, changed by anybody that it should not be changed. So that has been always there. Yeah. And and so if you go by that principle, yes, but I think where the conflict of interest comes is as I said, is when you want to monetize on that data, then then it's you know then yeah. it's about where you where you draw the line like you like I said, it's, it's a balance between uh, the, the customer experience and uh, you know, the yeah. And a lot to do, sorry, yeah, can I interrupt you? Yes. But do you think, Mr. Jaggi, that uh, possibly if uh, like a crime is being more uh, confidential or more particular about their data because they are patients, what from, what from a perspective of a consumer company, like for example, for example, it's Loon or is it Amazon or if it's a particular, any, just company. like a show company, a center point, a landmark group. So if they have, they also have apps these days. They also have a lot of sign-ups that you have to do. So do you think the perspective changes when it's just the end user who's just shopping around and in, in contrast to a patient? It, it does, I believe. It does because, you know, you're not impacting on uh, an individual's life. That's, you know, healthcare is different. It's going to be there. So I think they're a little more open there to actually use the data or for the marketing purposes. And uh, definitely they will what they call the cross-sell and off-sell will happen using the data. Depending on trends or behaviors. So there are engines which are even listening to uh, social media, they call social listening, you know, uh, that actually listens to your social behavior as well. And then look at your why you can sit down and if you're talking about Noon. So it not only knows what you're doing in Noon, but it also knows what you're doing on our social space. And then try to customize the product or uh, 
that's where they would like to train it, customize the product, but what they're doing is actually target market. Okay. Because they know you are a better potential customer for this product. So this is why I say, I mean, it's like how we word it, uh, how it's looked at. So the customer looks at it like, you know, customized for you, but the organization looks at it from a target market. And if you think of companies like Google, uh, their motorways don't do and don't be evil, but at the same time, if you question them about how they are keeping track of people, they'll say, you shouldn't be doing something that you wouldn't want others to know. So when a company has that kind of mentality, then you know your data is not going to be safe with them to begin with. Okay, next question, Okay, the next question has been asked by Akansha. Should companies be held responsible for the spread of false information on their platform? Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> right. So before we go to the experts, I would like to actually ask the students if you guys have an experience with that or would like to share or uh, before I move to the experts. Facebook or, or any other company promoting false data. So as I said in the start, uh, Facebook is so, uh, they had a small game in which uh, they would collect uh, customer information. Uh, and this information was used for the political uh, elections in US in 2016, in which uh, Trump was elected, unfortunately. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so this uh, data was uh, used unethically because uh, customers didn't know what it was being used for. And finally, uh, the election, the way they were uh, 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 poll, the poll, election poll was in favor of Donald Trump because those things he said was based on the information of uh, the customers. So uh, once this information was out that you know uh, uh, Facebook's game was uh, you know used for the election, uh, they had actually it didn't affect the shares of uh, Facebook at all. Uh, they actually had a it, it was more profitable after this for some reason. So, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, then because of which uh, Facebook had, a pay, had to pay a $5 million fine, which was the largest till now. So, yeah, this was one instance in which uh, company, a company, you know, used, uh, misused customer information. All right. Um, Source of the data and 
they don't really feel that it's not going. Um, and, and I would definitely say it's a good But there's just one thing that I would like to add to it, but that doesn't stop individual responsibility of all of us to actually ensure to double check what we're doing. Because the biggest problem we have today is that, you know, we just Google something and, you know, first thing that comes up, we take that as the right answer, which need not be the right answer. It does give that responsibility. And I think it's a very apt question to you because you're getting that information from a business. So if the business decides to give you a wrong number, for instance, and you put that on your website, that kind of reflects on my life, right? right? So what kind of uh, responsibility do you see from so yes, uh, as all of us rightly said that yes, if a business is giving up information and having information on their platform, they are responsible for all of it. So what we, from our perspective, what we try to do is that we do have a screening process before the data goes live on our website and mobile application. So we, yes, we visit the, uh, the place firstly, the businesses, we collect that data from them. The data comes on our system, we don't make it live immediately. We have other team, that's a quality analyst team, that rechecks. So they call up that particular business, they speak with them, they update them that yes, your business is listed on Hyperbuy, and we're just going to make it live, just want to confirm all the information that we have. So we have two human beings from the company, <laughs> who confirm all the information, and uh, that's when it goes live. Even after that, of course, a lot of companies open and close in Dubai on a day-to-day -day basis, so we also allow our users to update us that okay, like if this particular information is incorrect, please get back to us and we'll surely look into it immediately. So we also have that, of course, nobody can be 100% perfect. So we also give away that to our users to update us, put us in review, tell us more about what you find or what you don't find on our app. So we're trying to have that uh, connect with the users right. as well. But yes, we do we completely make sure that whatever data we upload it on our website and it's double checked before it's gone. Okay, from the audience or from the I think we'll take it from, okay, let's take it from. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, I have an experience to share as well. Uh, so I was traveling to the US last year, and uh, while traveling by like, at the airport itself, there was a local kiosk uh, selling some SIM card. So I went to the kiosk, bought a SIM card, activated it. Five or ten minutes later, I get a call from a bank asking if you want to grow on our investment. So, how do you get this data? It's such an interesting question to ask. Yeah. Uh, you, you got it on the same number that you took it from? I mean, the new on number? On the US number. Yeah. So, that's, that's why I was, I mean, as I said, it could be a coincidence that they had that number, maybe that number was used by somebody else. Okay. And, and, but they knew a name, right? Yeah. Like, well, traditionally, we just gave our email, and it was a new number. It was a new number, yeah. So it just goes back to the point that I was saying. The kiosk is actually, or, or who is selling you the SIM card, is actually doing the data monetizing that I'm talking about. They're cross-selling that data to the banks and others who could use this data. And that is the business model. So if you look at one of the business models of a weather company, which is bought over by uh, IBM data, you know, a weather company is not very profitable. They were, you know, you just, uh, forecasting that other that's all they were doing. But what they started doing later and why they become became very, you know, successful and why IBM bought them over later was they, they started partnering with uh, retailers, especially textiles, you know, telling them what kind of weather is upcoming in the next you know few days, next couple of months, so that actually they could uh, get the stocks into the store at the right time at the right, you know, right kind of things into the uh, into the into their stocks. So this is this is the kind of data cross selling or you know Data monetizing and mapping up. So that the weather company is not a harmful one to a customer, mm -hmm. more a useful one. But there are harmful ones of what we might consider, customers might consider as harmful, but the business, for the business of the business model of you know, monetizing the moment, they sold you that, they are, you know, they've made some money there. They're also making some money from fan by selling that data, saying that you are you just got this card and this is your contract. So they've got target you to back price strategy. Right? So there are concepts of uh, and acquisition cost, what's a new acquisition cost for a customer? So for them, just giving them a few amount of money and buying uh, a whole set of data set which has all the genuine contact details. And like you said, out of that, even a 10% converts to a buyer. You know, it's good enough for them because the acquisition cost is quite low. Right? So since that was not a question, we will take one more question. Yes, so I'll go on with um, the last question by Ms. J. 
Jamie Thakur. The real question is, even if a customer doesn't allow a company to access his or her data, um, what's the evidence that his data won't be leaked to other illegal ways? That's exactly what I was going to ask. Okay. All right. Um, so, Um, to be honest, uh, no, there is uh, no particular way of finding out whether they will be actually being used or not used for any other purposes. As Mr. Jerry Friedman mentioned, it's, it depends on the company. It, it's the choice of the company as to where they draw the line of the legality, of the ethical nature of their company and how they want to use that particular data. So no, you do not have a way to find out unless, unless you have any access to their ethical standards. <laughs> But uh, yes, again, we always just say that we need to be more careful if we are giving away our data. We need to be more careful of the apps we hold in our phones. Every app, there are many apps which don't even require your uh, permission for location or for accessing all the information that you put up. Smiles was a very good example by uh, the, the reward platforms that we have where we actually just show our phones at, on every purchase that we do in different stores, in different malls. So yes, we need to be more mindful as to what all, where all we give our data and what all we have on our phones these days. Because we have our phones literally at, at all times. Sometimes I feel so much of paranoia that I, one day I was just possibly talking about bicycle, bicycle. I should go there, it is good, I should buy a bicycle. I was just talking about it. And I saw the ad of that on Instagram and I got scared. <laughs> that am I being like, are my basic conversations also being recorded? So it's maybe possibly just my paranoia, but it sort of lets you think. It lets you thinking that am I is like is anything secure? Like of course you have mobile phones, you have tablets. Nowadays you have listening televisions as well, I think. So there's no place where you're not heard. So we need to be more mindful and careful. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you're supposed to be you're saying something? Actually no, I did a test on this. Um, you did a test I, on this. Yeah. So what I did was uh, for twenty seconds. I just uh, opened up my laptop and I just closed all the windows. And I just spoke about uh, say baby products like Johnson uh, Johnson Green or something. So the next, like after I open the browser, uh, say suppose I search or I go on some website, Google or anything, the ads on the side are uh, shown for baby products and all. So I'm not crazy. No. Yeah. 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 We had that happen as well. Uh, early morning, my husband and I decided we were going to change the tires of our car. Exactly. Twenty minutes later, twenty minutes later, both of us got this about tire discounts that were happening in different stores. Yeah, so a um, couple of things on this. So first thing is, yes, most of your devices are listening. There have been different experiences that have been experiments done. If you see on the YouTube, there are quite a few of them. Even after turning off a mobile phone without a SIM card, you walk around the back and it's still listening. It, 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 not listening, but it's able to figure out where all your phones. But with the SIM card, if it's not, if it's not being used, you block that and get it, they're still listening to the conversation. And you get marketed for those terms that you mentioned. So that's one part of it. Um, going back to what the, the app that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, the, the telecom company is also doing um, a product that which they are selling to, to companies like ours and the uh, other company here, where they call the closed loop marketing, right? If you're doing the marketing on the radio, how do you know how many listeners have listened to it, right? Yeah. So what they give you is this app is actually listening you know, on the radio, when you are on the radio. So they actually look back and tell you how many people have actually listened, listened to the radio app. So you know, <laughs> these are things that are being done today. Right? So this, these, these are reality, I mean, it's being done today. So this is, this is one part of it. Going back to the question of, you know, will, even after saying that I don't want this data to be used, will they use the data? Uh, most likely no, because the companies are quite concerned of their brand name and the risk that they have because the moment that use it and use you, there are ways like, you know, uh, digital forensics and others, if you raise a case and if you have suspicion, yes, there are ways to actually find out. In terms of digital forensics, it's not easy, but it, it is a cost we are there, but if it goes to a legality, yes, that's where it go. And, and if that happens, yes, there is a, you know, a reputation problem as well as the, the penalties, like the high penalties. The chance, that's why the chances of doing that by any you know, sensible organization is very, very less. But normally what happens is if a hacker gets in and gets your data, then it's That's where most of the time happens. 
and it's clearly going to happen with other organizations and the type of data which has a bigger value in the, in the black market or what they call the market. Okay. So if there's a bigger value in the data in the market, yes, they would attack with the data. If they get that data, yes, that's how it works most of the time. Okay. And the last thing I want to add to that is uh, when you talk about hackers and all these things happening, most of the time these don't happen by getting you know, going at your data or companies misuse it. Most of the time, these, you know, all these target marketing or even misuse of data happens on with the data that you actually that you have freely put up on, on different places. All right. um, and I'll, I was just citing an example or an incident that we had an experience on that we did uh, in my previous organization when I was working for Black So Black Black. Uh, with the permission of one person, we went into these three social media sites. One was Facebook, the other one was uh, LinkedIn, and there was one of the three of them, right? And we were actually able to do kind of uh, identity theft of that person by just looking at three social media uh, you know, platforms. Because on your Facebook, you'll have everything that's personal, including, you know, where you got married, which university you went to, you know, what, what dress you wore, you know, what you ate the previous night, you know, what dress you wore the, during your wedding, who came to your wedding, entire information, right? On a, on a LinkedIn, if you go and you have the entire information of, you know, again, going from, from the university, maybe sometimes even the schools, the universities, you know, you, you see, you know, what has been, which organizations they work for, who are their managers, entire thing. Now, it's very easy for, with these information, for me to predict, I mean, to, I have that information, let's say, about you. Right. So it's very easy for me, who has not seen you, to go and tell that person that, you know, you and <laughs> you, right? Because I have the entire information. Yeah. That's what is, you know, identity theft in, in today's world. Because today, no organization actually physically sees a person. Everything is digital. So it's very easy for What is the normal, normal question? What is the second question when you have, you know, you have forgotten your password? Mm -hmm. Mother's maiden name. How difficult <laughs> is that to find on, 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 on a social media? You know, your date of birth, place you were born. All this is available. So most of the challenge or most of the problem is the data that we're putting in very freely everywhere on social media. Nobody is asking you. No company is asking for this. Yeah. You actually post it. That is where that is the data which is the most misused data. So with that, um, any last thoughts from our panel and then I will close. Okay. Yeah. So basically, I just want to ask uh, for you in the. Healthcare firm that you work for, and you were in high Dubai, and uh, you were in education. So, what what are the measures that your company takes to protect the information and data that is given to you? I think as educators, um, we were asked to sign a 15-page document, not by the university but by the ruler's court, uh, which all educators in the UAE have to sign, and. This one sentence really stood out for me, which said, if there is a breach, any of any of or any of the terms and conditions, and one of them of course was the safety and privacy of the students' information that they were handling, was either gonna be fine, jail, or death. So you know, that statement kind of stayed with all of us. And I don't think we with the education sector are really be thinking about anything to do with breaching of data. That sentence, and we signed it like four or five years ago, and I still remember, if I close my eyes, I still see the statement, because it was one of those things that I took away, and I was like, did they really say that? And they did, because they are taking it that seriously, that we in the education um, industry, we actually have the power to change people's perspectives. And if I'm actually harvesting student information, I could easily cater my, whatever my agenda is, to particular students. So. They're ensuring that we don't do that. So I think even before the university, the government itself has put that in place for us. Uh, I think my answer goes for the same because as I have said, that High Dubai is an initiated by the Dubai Economic Department and their rules, their regulations, their privacy rules, their ethical nature is of very, very high standards. So we aren't even allowed to be working on a sheet which is more, but more than a certain number of businesses. So whenever we work on our particular, uh, our agenda or our uh, target, whatever it is, we don't even have data in our hands readily and we don't even pass it on to our teams. So if I, for example, get a data set of 100 businesses, I pass it to my team in 10, 10, 10, 10. And that in different formats. 
which is very difficult to understand or detect or to make one particular list of. So yes, there are a lot of uh, uh, ways in which we try to make sure that no bulk data goes around. Because as I mentioned, our USB or our data importance is the bulk of data that we have throughout categories, throughout locations, throughout uh, business owners or branches. So that's how we make sure that uh, the data does not go out of hands of uh, whoever are actually working on it. Or, or when we delegate it as well, we make sure we break it down. And I don't know. Um, I think data security itself is a huge uh, area of its own, but just to give you in addition to the, the laws and the norms that is here, which is pretty strong and, and it's maturing as well, so it has carried out almost everything as well, so it's something that will come up. Um, there's a recent law that has been passed and the draft file carriage is coming as well, which is even more significant. But on top of that, I think any organization, what they run, normally do is they, they start with the data classification. There is a data classification that happens in terms of What's a public data? If it's public data, there's no harm in you know, putting it in any of it and we're going to put it in public. You know, what is the you know, private data and what is a highly confidential or confidential data? So depending on the data classification and how you classify it, and then you should, that's how you define it, what mechanisms and what tools that are applied to our mechanisms and tools that are that I'll apply. So what you apply for, let's say, a, a kind of like private data, uh, it, will, it will not be the same that you will apply for a heavy which you will really actually apply much more than um, Maybe like, like, like you said, the same data set, you know, you will not go to one person, you might split it in pieces. Um, very few people will have access to it, you will implement maybe two-factor, three-factor authentication before you get to that data. Whereas, uh, you know, a, a private data, you might just have a one-factor authentication. So there will be lots of different rules if you do that. Um, but it all depends on how you classify the data and what's the level of the tool that you want to get it. Okay, so with that, I think the, the main point to take away from here is we can't just blame one stakeholder. Uh, everybody has equal responsibility, shared responsibility in ensuring the privacy and security of data that's going around. Yes, we are living in a data uh, economy. Uh, data is driving every sector that we can think of in the economy. So data is important, it is the prime currency. And that also means that means the responsibility of ensuring the protection of that data then becomes the topmost priority, for either it's for government, for organizations, or for consumers. So I would like to thank definitely the students uh, for being here, and of course our industry experts for, um, and our uh, moderator and MC for the day. So thank you everyone, thank you so much. <laughs>